For the Wild is brought to you in part by the Calliopeia Foundation. We are grateful for their continued support and the support of grassroots contributions from listeners like you. Learn more at calliopeia.org. To make a donation, visit forthewild.world slash donate or find us on Patreon. If you'd like to support us in other ways, consider sharing our episodes through social media or leaving us a review wherever you listen to the podcast. Hey, For the Wild community, it's Ayana here. Before we begin the show, I wanted to take a moment to talk about our Patreon. We are so grateful to all of the amazing members of our community who contribute to bringing this podcast to life each week. We couldn't do this work without you. To keep For the Wild freely accessible to all, Long term, we're exploring how we can fund the podcast without resigning ourselves to overly commercializing our airtime in order to sustain production. We believe that independent media plays an essential role in telling the truth outside of corporate agendas, and we want to be in integrity as much as possible with how we support this work. We have around 700 Patreon members currently, and we are dreaming into a goal for our Patreon community to grow to 2,000 supporting members in the coming months. Join us at patreon.com slash for the wild. And if you're already supporting us in one way or another, we want to thank you so much and wish you a beautiful season wherever you are. Hello and welcome to For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayana Young. Today I'm speaking with Tyson Yankapoda. This is where hope is a destructive force in the universe. Hope is like part of what, what keeps us all enslaved. And that, that it speaks to that narcissistic core. Tyson Yankapora is an academic, an arts critic, and a researcher who belongs to the Apalech clan in far north Queensland. He carves traditional tools and weapons and also works as a senior lecturer in indigenous knowledges at Deakin University and Melbourne. Well, hello, Tyson, to For the Wild podcast. I'm so looking forward to spending this time with you. Yeah, it's good to be here, Yana. Wonderful. So in preparation for our time together, I came across a conversation you had with Howard Johnson where you shared the sentiments, quote, we used to fight to change conditions. Now we fight to change perception, end quote. And Mm. I'd really like to begin our conversation here because it's such a succinct vocalization of a phenomenon that has really taken over in many of the spaces myself and For the Wild listeners exist in. And part of me wonders if this shift is perhaps a byproduct of generations growing up in a capitalist system where good branding is enough. But as a guiding topic into our conversation, I wonder if you could elaborate on this and what you think it will take for us to free ourselves from our obsession with perception. I mean, perception is really important, but it's also, it can be manipulated. And then I guess it's the same. It's that multipolar trap of, um, you know, the proliferation of perverse incentives and, um, you know, that tragedy of the commons where, you know, you only have to have one person, you know, doing the wrong thing and gaining an unfair advantage. And then everybody has to do it, even if it's going to wreck everything. (laughs) So, you know, we've had a, a quite a few decades now of powerful people manipulating our perception. And I guess more and more people have been getting in on that game to the point where anybody who's anybody in the power broking business has got to have, you know, PR people, marketing people, they've got to have, um, you know, psychologists who can tortures of freedom, ah, spin on everything, you know, and sort of change perception. But it's funny that it's democratized so much now. Well, not democratized, let's call it metastasized um, because it's now everybody has to have their room. Um, their nuclear weapon if you know what i mean it's um so basically every single person on the planet is in the business of uh, perception management and uh everybody's perception and opinion is sacred and everybody can have their own opinions they can have their own facts and like i said to howie there was a time when we'd be fighting to change our condition 
but we've found increasingly, you know, in, in the last decade or so that that's, um, that's, it's just not acceptable. You're not allowed to change the actual material, physical conditions. You're not allowed to do anything that will affect the economy or the marketplace, but we've been sort of let loose on this new frontier, this new frontier that everybody can colonize and be pioneers of and, you know, go out and, um, claim and name and build and brand all of their um, personal and group identities and um, alternative facts and this position and that position and this standpoint and that standpoint on everything and just uh, have so many billions of different competing narratives all jostling for space out there. It's like everybody has, you know, access to those weapons of mass PR now which ironically makes them less powerful, but it also sort of prevents anybody from, you know, we have, and so people can rise up and go, yes, extinction rebellion. That sounds huge. That sounds like we're all going to throw our bodies on the machinery and bring it all to a halt. We're going to do something to change the condition. But I mean, what happened really? A few people went on a few hunger strikes. There was some placards, you know, nothing really changes. <laughs> Yeah, it's really tricky. But you can't even talk about this, you know, because everything is, you know, splintered and fractured into a thousand different points of view and a thousand different, you know, sets of alternative facts. So even this, you can't even talk about it. In the alt right, they call what we're talking about now um, cultural Marxism. So, you know, that idea that, you know, Marxism 1.0 was all about redistributing wealth focusing on capital versus labor and all that sort of stuff and and making sure things would be fair and people could have a weekend and and you know wouldn't die too young and all that sort of thing like it was actually focused on conditions and then the idea that oh it's marxism 2.0 cultural marxism is just you know uh, the change that we're allowed to have is in the culture is in the perception you know is in the all the rest um but that branding, I mean, that's all sort of tainted and spun around these sort of you know, facts about the liberal left and it's trying to couch or disguise or mask, you know, quite a bit of racism and and misogyny and all that sort of stuff. So that's that branding of it. And you've got then you've got the old school Marxists and their branding of it. Then you've got this one, that one, you've got the woke sort of branding of it, which is just uh, everything is different <laughs> you know it's just it's just such a mess and you know i mean you can see that all sort of spinning you know out in this sort of chaotic mishmash of ideas and no sense no meaning making it all going on in any meaningful way that's actually you know people are able to agree on a broad sort of reality that we can sort of work around you know, individually and collectively, that, that's, that's kind of, that's gone. I'm not sure it's coming back, you know? Um, so it's just going to be different groups and group identities just fighting brand wars and even physical wars, maybe even civil wars or certainly civil wars. Um, yeah. On and on for, I, I can't see that ending in the next decade. Mm -hmm. Can you, what do you think the next decade looks Ooh. like? Where do I begin? <laughs> it's like, am I in my radical imagination? Let, let's start with this weekend. Yeah. So what's going to happen <laughs> this weekend where you are? Yeah. And um, yeah, well, if we were having this interview mm -hmm. next week, it might look a little different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm interested when you said that we're not changing conditions, it's because of the economy or if you could just elaborate a bit more on why you think we resist changing conditions. Mm. Well, uh, let me just mm, give you an example of the indigenous Australian experience. There are, you know, millions every year budgeted for indigenous communities and programs uh, such as, I mean, the broad policy idea is closing the gap. I think we borrowed that from Canada you know, so closing the gap in life expectancy, education, health, etc., uh, because it's a significant gap between the indigenous population and the rest. But yeah, it's not about 
So, so millions are spent. Most of that money goes into um, the wages of um, non-Indigenous administrators who keep endlessly just administering these programs and then um, evaluating them and coming up with uh, having to do reports on why it's not working. You know, every year, and it's been like that for decades and decades. Um, and there are endless, endless conferences. So a lot of money goes into um, grants and funding for running conferences on how to uh, change the condition of Indigenous people. And uh, I've been going to these conferences for a couple of decades now. Uh, I don't anymore because it's a waste of time. They've been saying the same thing for decades at these conferences. It's just rehashing the same conference papers over and over again. It's just this, you know, closing the gap industrial complex or something. And, you know, you go there and you see all these people who have, they've been put up in, you know, flash motel rooms. And then you walk around at the, the lunch and there's all canapes and stuff like that. And, you know, oh, that's where all the money's going. Um, I used to get invited to do quite a few uh, keynote speeches and stuff at these conferences. But um, about 10 years ago, I, I started um, every keynote speech with, did you enjoy your lunch? Looks really good. How's your motel room? Is that lovely? Yeah, this is, this is a beautiful conference. It is really good to be able to take a few days off work and walk around and meet people. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I, nothing's changed. And I tell you, if you just took the money for this conference and put it directly into the bank accounts of the people that you're trying to figure out how to help, then the gap will close like a motherfucker. And I would say that, <laughs> you know, uh, cause that I, I think, you know, you need to use language in that way sometimes to sort of shock people a little bit into, cause they'll remember what you just said. Uh, after a while they stopped inviting me because that wasn't the message that they want to hear. It's pretty much anything but actually redo, actually, you know, giving the wealth directly to people uh, instead of, you know, running programs that are going to help them to become better people so that they can access the opportunities of the marketplace better and pull their bootstraps up. You know, that, that attitude's never going to change, you know, and it's very difficult because we, um, you know, we had, it was only a few decades ago that was still this thing going on that had been happening for a very long time called uh, stolen wages. So for a long time in Australia, our communities, our Indigenous communities, we weren't allowed to receive our own wages because we weren't trusted to be able to spend the money properly. You know, so our wages would be held in trust for us and we'd be given just enough to, for basic survival, for basic food and clothing, you know, very basic. And the rest of it was held in accounts in trust for us to be given back to us. So anyway, the upshot of all that is that, um, you know, in the end, so we had generations and generations uh, having their wages stolen. And what happened in the end was the government kept all of that money, everybody's wages, and they spent it all on uh, infrastructure. So in the end, it was indigenous um, wages held in trust that built you know, all of the roads and all of the bridges, you know, all of these things. And in the meantime, non-Indigenous people got to build up uh, intergenerational wealth. And these aren't, you know, investors and all this sort of thing. These are just unskilled workers who are able to have an unskilled job and just work for three or five years and, and buy a house and then work for another three or five years and buy another house. And, you know, so you got quite, you know, uneducated uh, unskilled sort of people, multi-generational, not particularly special, amazing people, um, you know, who've ended up being quite wealthy. And that's an intergenerational equity thing too, because, you know, the millennials, even, you know, some non-Indigenous ones, they can't, they can't do that anymore. They'll be spending their entire lives trying to scrape together enough to get a mortgage that they'll never pay off. And <laughs> if they're lucky, you know, um, yeah. So these are the material conditions and you're not allowed to campaign to change those. I mean, you're allowed to campaign, but you have no, you're not allowed to actually change that. But I tell you, you can have a lot of wins if you're just changing. Well, I want to have this word eliminated or I want to add this word. You know, I want to change our language 
so that we can airbrush this intensely inequitable system. It demands inequality just to be able to function, but we won't worry about the system. We're not allowed to look at that. What we're going to do is just tweak it to make it feel more fair, to make it feel more equitable so that, you know, I mean, we can be completely destroying minority communities, uh, but as long as, you know, we're using the right language about those communities, then, you know, we've won the battle. <laughs> so it's just, yeah, it, it's just that, it's just basically everybody's involved in neuro-linguistic programming, bloody wars. Other people call them culture wars, but, <laughs> you know, it's just um, this endless battle for, this endless PR battle you know, with everybody behaving as a corporation unto themselves in charge of their own branding, choosing all their little identities and intersectionalities and gathering together their little echo chambers and their networks and going, well, this is what I like and this is this reflects who I am and this is the narrative and if I can get more followers than anybody else, then, you know, I win. The <laughs> My narrative is the dominant narrative and comes out on top in this little sector over here. And then we can go to war with that sector over there. I mean, it's just uh, a game theoretical, uh, just nightmare, endless stuff. And of course, I mean, that ends up, you know, exploding out into physical violence as well. And which, you know, there's nothing wrong with a little bit of violence, but um, as long as it's productive. Mm. Wow. So much in your response and, in thinking about perception, I can't help but want to interrogate the ways in which many of us are identifying ourselves to each other. Bluntly put, you've articulated that there will be massive ramifications if we don't bring non-Indigenous people back into relationship with the land. And I think in many cases, non-Indigenous people are really feeling this separation. But rather than delving into the trickier parts of this, it's a lot easier to tend to an ancestral lineage or even a nationality. And while I think this is done with the right intentions for the most part, there are moments where it also feels like an attempt at gaining social capital, not honoring one's responsibility to place. So moving into a discussion on identity, I wonder if you could share your response to the sort of performance of identity that is becoming quite rampant versus the call to become responsible to your place in the immediate? Well, basically, um, if you're a millennial or, I mean, even most of Gen X, but, you know, if you're a millennial or next on, if you are like 30 or under or even mid thirties and under, you're not ever going to have any financial capital. Chances are wherever you are in the world, it's, you're, you're not going to have that kind of capital, but the capital that's available to you is, um, you know, is, is, is basically around your identity. You can have cultural capital, social capital, um, all those kinds of things. And some of these things can be leveraged for a little bit of value or a little bit of position, you know, so that you can move around in a pecking order. And it's funny, there's a kind of biological capital that's, that's associated with that now. So over on Turtle Island, where you are, you're, you're in the States, mm -hmm. America's, um, you know, Kim Tolbear, I don't know if you've come across her. Yeah, I've interviewed her. She, she's written quite extensively about this uh, fetishization of, of, of genealogy and a, a genetic inheritance, you know, a bloodline and all these sorts of things. Um, and the idea of, of this being a kind of capital of this being, you know, something that somebody, you know, owns intrinsically inside themselves that they can sort of curate and narrativize and fetishize as a marker of their identities and, you know, intersectionalities and the rest. <laughs> so rather than kind of, you know, living in that struggle and working to change condition, it's, it's about, it, it becomes more about branding oneself. It's very tricky. It's a, um, just perception is everything at the moment. You know, so a lot of our scholarship as indigenous people and minority scholarship, you know, queer theory and everything else, uh, critical race theory, these things uh, have a really solid base in very rigorous academic work. 
that a lot of people just struggled and struggled and bled for to make happen and carve out space for that in our institutions. You know, so we had, um, you know, post-colonial theory, you know, standpoint theory, you know, all of these things are critical race theory, queer theory, all these things were built on a really solid foundation of very rigorous research, you know, that really did um, uncover all the machinations of power and how these things work and um, how to make spaces within that discourse, you know, for a voice to emerge to actually change the condition um, of things. That, that's what that was about until really recently. But what I've noticed over the last decade is people engaging with that in increasingly shallow ways um, around their personal branding and their fetishization of their, um, you know, their inherited biologies and inherited, um, you know, inequalities and all of these sorts of things, uh, whereby they get this idea that just any random thought that flits across their consciousness is truth and wisdom and logic you know, sort of washed clean, made pure and and always containing pure truth, no matter what, just on the basis of their kind of uh, cultural capital and, and um, you know, identity capital and all that sort of thing. Um, it's just, it's this insane magical thinking that's sort of taken over something that was quite a strong discipline. And it gives us a bad name because I know a lot of really good thinkers and I'm involved in a lot of communities of really good thinkers and rigorous change makers who've completely rejected, you know, all post-colonial theory, standpoint theory, postmodernism. They, they just laugh at that because all they see is this um, silly work being done uh, and this stuff that's, it's just not rigorous. It's not tested against anything. It's, it's invalid. It's not verifiable. Um, the people who are doing it are not attempting to falsify what they're looking at to test it and put it through the fires of a, a real process of inquiry anymore. And so it's just all flippant and vague and just uh, self-indulgent and stupid. And so understandably, it it's just has no respect anymore. And I think it's um it's really done an injustice to all the people who fought rigorously in that space you know, to give us the methodological tools and epistemological tools to be able to, you know, leverage some real change in the conditions of the world. Um, but, you know, all these insane, like, you know, wokesters and alt-right and alt-left and, you know, uh, weirdos have sort of taken over with absolutely no rigor. So I find it really hard because a lot of my work uh, over the decades has been using a lot of those tools and building on them and you know, um, bringing out new, really good methods of inquiry grounded in our uh, ancient traditions, you know, of inquiry and, you know, making really rigorous tools for research and such. And then um, all of that's tainted with the same, <laughs> attard with the same brush, if you like now. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of, it's diminished our capital and leverage in the real world but sort of increased our fabulousness in the sort of shadow world of cybernetic narcissism and hubris. <laughs> I think trying to interrogate the way we cling to our identities, the way we mark ourselves through space, 
opens up more room to discuss what you talk about as a hybridized insight. And many mm. are eager to explore the fruitfulness of the liminal and in-between spaces in general, but especially so in terms of the importance of intermediaries who really challenge supremacist or colonial rigidity. And how after decades of this narrative of never being enough of one thing, this perspective may actually be enough to serve as a bridge during times of transformation and breakdown. So what is hybridized insight to you? And do you think hybridized insight can also serve as a remedy to the mass memory loss and cultural loss that dominates in Western systems? Mm. Well, I mean, hybridization is just, it's what, I mean, it almost doesn't exist because it implies that there are separate closed systems that sometimes come together and, and hybridize, you know, but um, I mean, the reality of the natural world and of what you're calling the wild, these are <laughs> fairly permeable membranes in these sort of separate uh, systems that aren't really separate. You know, all of these things are mixing, combining, moving all the time. There was that idea in early science where, you know, everything in the whole world was named and classified and given a location, you know, under the idea that that's where God put it. So that's where it belongs. Z is for zebra and they're from Africa, you know, etc. Uh, so there's this kind of perception that everything is in its place and that it's weird now because things are now moving out of their place and mixing. But in reality, that is what happens. You, there is uh, exchange and interaction constantly occurring uh, in wild systems. There is, um, I mean, so an ecosystem will move a couple of hundred meters every year. It's constantly moving. And there is constant exchange between those systems. A system in itself, if it was just self-contained, uh, entropy will build up in that over time. That's the that, um, second law of thermodynamics, and, and it will just collapse in on itself. So, you know, so every system must dump entropy out into another system. Um, and in, in nature, the idea is like the way that's evolved is that, um, you know, the entropy that you're dumping is another system's lunch. You know, so you're having, you're putting that into there and then that system is also exchanging things back. So it's, it's, there's this constant flow. There is these um, closed loops of flows between and among and across systems constantly in a myriad of ways um, so that there are no separate systems in the end. There are no closed systems. So, you know, the second law of thermodynamics is really only a theoretical state. You can't really have that entropy, you know, in a vacuum because that vacuum doesn't exist. It's the first law of thermodynamics, that uh, idea that, you know, nothing's created or destroyed. It just moves around a bit would be a simple way of saying it, <laughs> which unfortunately then changes your notion of time, etc. So, you know, the idea of hybridity itself is, is kind of, you know, supposing this separation that doesn't really exist. But I guess when things have been separated for a long time and then they come together, you get this thing that's noted by dog breeders and stuff like that, you know, so populations or systems that have been separated for quite some time you know, artificially or otherwise, when they come together, there is an explosion of vigor. But I really just, uh, I, I feel that that's just uh, the wild, wildness um, reasserting itself and celebrating for a minute. It's like, oh, thank God, you know. <laughs> I mean, so this happens with uh, genetics, you know, but it also happens with um, just, I mean, ideas. Ideas um, exist within evolutionary pressures and, and, um, you know, laws as well. And there are always Cambrian explosions when you, when, you know, systems come together and dance together that have been, you know, uh, previously separated. So I guess that's that idea of that, uh, those hybridized insights. You have exciting things. The only problem is, I mean, and this is another thing because the perception Nazis have taken over everything, it's hard to talk about. <laughs> You know, it's hard to talk about power in this because that's something that actually messes that process up. There isn't free exchange. It's very difficult when we're sitting under a global economic system, an Anglosphere, 
that sort of taints everything with unequal power relations. Every exchange is, you know, sitting under the framework of an economic system that demands inequality for anything to have value. So therefore, when we have dialogue, you know, um, when we have a dialogical, you know, approach to things and where there's a cultural interface happening, you know, between two cultural systems, uh, power dynamics, unfortunately, unequal power dynamics will come into play and actually skew that and mess it up. You know, so you inevitably have one group uh, that's existing in an extractive relation with the other group and you just can't have good thinking and good exchange and, you know, third culture innovations, et cetera, emerging when you have that kind of power imbalance. And you can't address that power imbalance through fricking optics. You can't just have a few different colored faces around the table and go, look, look, we got a CEO who's, you know, from this minority group or whatever, that, that's optics. That, that doesn't change the quality of the thinking. You know, you've got this, you've always got this sort of um, Anglo-Western kind of thinking coming out on top as the default and everybody else has to sort of orbit around that and translate their, their ideas across to that. And then that, that center, the Anglo center chooses what it's going to use and it sort of takes bits and pieces of it. You know, not entire ideas like, oh my God, we're not going to take the whole Vedic tradition. Uh, we're just going to take this bit, the breathing technique. All right, um, we'll turn that into mindfulness and <laughs> send that out to every corporate, corporate and everybody has to do the training. You know, so everything's simplified, rebranded, repackaged and just, um, you know, pretty much destroyed, uh, commodified, commercialized. And I guess that's the same thing that's happening with our identities and uh, activism and everything else we're, we're just um we're just selling we're all selling and buying together mm -hmm. uh in in some highly skewed power dynamics uh which for most of us is a zero-sum game isn't that awful mm -hmm. can we make the next question a nice one <laughs> uh, like you know about something lovely <laughs> well yeah, it's, it's heavy and it's also honest. And I think sometimes that blunt honesty in a world of fake news is really refreshing. Mm. Uh, there's something I think kind of relieving just to truth tell to one another and take down the masks and stop playing the games and stop trying to make everything sound like a branded clean package with a bow wrapped ready to go. Uh, with the mm. solutions inside you know it's it's um it's real and there's something yeah just there's something light about just actually being real with people these days i think the heaviness to me yeah. comes in from a lot of the confusion and not feeling like i can trust things that people are saying and that really weighs me down i feel like if there is one thing i've really felt incredibly committed to conveying on the podcast and exploring it in conversation is the reality that there are no solutions. The solution mm. is a capitalist endeavor. And so in this sense, chasing down a solution to the problems of our time is a colossal waste of time. And similarly, yeah. I've heard you share that in lieu of solutions, we should be, quote, fostering the right environment for emergence, end quote. Mm. And so I'd like to ask you more about what you see as the environment for emergence, because certainly what it invokes for me is the importance of relinquishing our attachment to normalcy, because emergence certainly does not bloom in the stagnant waters of the status quo. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it, it does come from... Yeah, the, the stagnant waters. So you think about, um, you know, energies and flows that you can tap into and connect with and find that pattern in there and be responsive. I don't mean emotions, but feeling as a way of thinking, you know what I mean? Uh, like connecting with that gut, you know, through things and finding a path through. And suddenly everything just comes together. Everything connects up. Everything fits into your day you just brilliant ideas, amazing things come in, 
you know, huge conversations, you get a Cambrian explosion of movement and productivity and, you know, really organic sort of fecundity starts coming in your life. All the plants in your garden start growing better. It's, it's, it's brilliant. Um, if you can maintain that, the only problem though, is that there are competing energies and competing flows from different systems going on. And sometimes you might think that what you're tapping into is the wild. You might think that what you're tapping into is that hundred percent free range organic um, <laughs> universal energy. But what you're actually tapping into is, um, is there is the net that's been placed over that. You might be actually tapping into um, marketplace energies and you think what you're doing is authentic because that net that's been placed over the world, you know, it, it has a shadow copy, an image of everything else in the world that's in nature uh, and all the good and evil in all of us and every individual. There is a um, crappy shadow <laughs> a version of that in this net that's around the world, this kind of shadow world. And it's hard to know when you're plugged into that shadow world or into the real world. You know, the, the shadow world is easy to slip into. It's like a warm bath. It's a lot easier. So, you know, are you doing the Vedic tradition or are you doing mindfulness <laughs> kind of thing is, a, is an example. Everything has a shadow. Um, you might think you're being a revolutionary and you got that Che Guevara poster on your wall or whatever. You think you're being that, but you actually not you're actually being manipulated in that shadow world as well and it's very hard to know when ah, to know the difference so you know when you're sitting around you're having a meeting or a group and you're trying to do it organically instead of you know talking stick everybody gets to talk or like you know ask permission to speak or whatever instead of that structured thing you're actually just letting a free-flowing conversation happen and you just know when it's your turn to speak and when it's your time to speak and when you have something important to offer the group, this collective mind that's emerging in the group and you feel that increase happening in your body, you get physiological signs and you feel drawn to speak and you let the words come out and everybody's doing that and it's flowing amazingly. Uh, but then you get somebody who thinks they're feeling that, but that's not what they're feeling at all. You know, they're feeling actually they're, sort of fetishized you know identity politic shadow um <laughs> and you know they end up you know monologuing from that and actually throwing out the collective group mind there it's the same as that you know it's it's very it's very tricky to know when you're in the real thing or when you're in the shadow it's it's difficult you need more than one mind on that at a time but eh. You need a lot of people with you and to have your back. The uh, problem with that, though, is trust. And in this economic system, global economic system, trust is the thing that can't scale. So any system that you have of exchange uh, has to be something that finds a way to eliminate or police trust through a blockchain, maybe, or through a, you know, um, you know, fungible token of exchange of currencies or, you, you, you know, to facilitate that currency exchange, you know, where you know you're going to be able to have some kind of trust or you're going to be able to enforce trust through laws or whatever like that. Yeah, and, and that's a very difficult thing to do just in your interactions and networking. And so, yeah, that trust doesn't scale uh, too well. Because I guess getting back to our original idea, all you need is one bad actor, one person acting in bad faith to extract more from the commons and damage the commons and to you know gain some kind of advantage and upset the power balance. And, um, and then everybody has to do it. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> the whole place is wrecked. There's a path you've never seen There's a place you've never been And we're going In between here and there Hey, it's hardly anywhere But you'll know
There's a stair for you to climb. Get a penny for your time. Get a dozen for your dime. Make your money. Well, I've also heard you emphasize the importance of looking at what we can recover rather than what we can solve. And I think this inquiry into recovery is really fertile because it is in tandem with a conversation on the Western propensity for extraction. And in terms Mm. of climate change and adaptation, it's really a Western extraction of knowledge and an obsession with saving the last vestiges of whatever we can. And that is so pervasive. But knowledge doesn't bring us into relationship. And while I understand that a Western system in decay Mm. would become hyper-obsessed with saving, as it's sort of the opposite side of the same coin of extraction. So I wonder if you could speak to the importance and practice of recovering. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this preservation and conservation narratives, I mean, these are tied to a a deep-seated fear of the Anglosphere and the people who benefit from it, that they're going to lose all their shit (laughs) in order for everything to survive and for everybody to thrive and to to actually preserve what's going on, you know, um, the systems that we need to be able to survive. That would mean a lot of people have to give up you know, like uh, like everybody's going, uh, you know, all these terrible things that have happened. Oh, no, that's in the past. That's in the past. We're all equal now. Uh, but I'm going to keep all this capital. Um, I have to. That's mine. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, I don't know. There are a lot. There are so many movements and organizations that are just dedicated to making change in the world right now. And the ones who are the most rigorous, I found it in their thinking and who do the best analyses are unfortunately um that they, they, they're they're also stand i mean it's it's very much in you know the the tech the tech world and the business world and you know it's all people who've come to a realization in that and are actually you know really doing amazing things a lot of scientists a lot of amazing thinkers you know forming these big communities to make systemic change but a lot of it is grounded in in like once you start digging you scratch through that surface it's grounded in uh, this this desire to preserve civilization. We've got to save civilization. It's um, it's like oh my god, this there's an existential threat to the civilization. How do we save it? And I'm not talking about the billionaires because the billionaires aren't interested in saving civilization either. They have their bunkers in New Zealand, and I know that sounds like a crazy conspiracy theory, but it's it's true. It's verifiable public record <laughs> knowledge that they've all openly, you know, billionaires have openly declared, yeah, no, this is all going to, uh, they call it the event in capital letters, you know, when rule of law is gone, when, you know, a, a nuclear winter or, a, or whatever, it's like, well, this, this is all crashing. We've got to have our bunkers. And the only thing they haven't been able to resolve is how they're going to make, sh- uh, keep their security forces legal. Because most of the military in the uh, in the world at the moment is in uh, private private forces, private privately owned militaries. Uh, so it's all these billionaires and stuff. So that's not who I'm talking about. The mega powerful, they're not interested in saving civilization, you know. But a lot of the people in the middle, you, you bougie bougie bastards in uh, science, tech, you know, economics, business, finance, all these sorts of things, they are quite desperately um, keen to save civilization. So a lot of the ideas, I mean, that trickles down. So a lot of people, when they're into conservation, preservation, they need to preserve the biosphere that allows civilization to happen. It's people who've realized that when the biosphere is gone, civilization's done as well. So how do we save civilization? Well, uh, <laughs> we have to save the biosphere. So somehow, yeah, we want to keep our, <laughs> our economic system that's, inimical to the biosphere we want to keep that somehow while saving the biosphere that it depends on uh we want to have our cake and eat it too you know and so i mean i guess everybody's trying to do that and so but even though like i said the mega rich who have their bunkers and and private armies they still don't know how they're going to stop those private armies from just 
kicking down the bunker door and taking over and drinking all their brandy. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, so they're a bit terrified about that. Everyone's a bit terrified that they won't be able to hold on to their accumulated shit, which is basically what civilization is based on. So, you know, when people are looking at the end of civilization, they're looking at the end of safety and that safety doesn't mean my person will be damaged. No, no. Or my family will be damaged. No, no. It's like no property. We need to be able to protect property. We need to be able to protect our capital. And 60% of the capital in the world is what? Land is most of the capital in the world. That's what's used to leverage you know, all these, you know, derivatives and futures into infinity is, is that land. That's why we're not allowed to have access to it as human beings, as organisms that um, needs a habitat to survive. Uh, we're not allowed to access our habitat because that's somebody else's capital uh, that they're leveraging for debt to keep investing and reinvesting and then drawing, and creating more capital and borrowing against that. Um, it's a horrendous magic trick. It's that desire to have cake and eat it too, but they don't realize. No, maybe they do realize. I mean, all they're doing is stealing from the future. They're stealing from all the millennials and from everybody else coming after them, which is a bit tragic. Similarly, I'd like to talk about preparedness, and typically there seems to be a fixation on either physical preparedness or emotional resilience when talking about the apocalypse or societal collapse. But less are these two bridged or put into conversation together. So I'm wondering what tangible resilience in crisis looks like to you? It quite simply looks like diversity. You know, so you need, you need community and strong community. But if in your community everybody thinks the same way and believes in the same thing and is acting and living the same way, you don't have any resilience. The resilience only comes through diversity, like real, genuine diversity. So I'm not talking about, you know, you've got some Sikhs and you've got some, I don't know, Latvian transgender people there and you've got some, you know, uh, differently abled people there and cognitively diverse people there and these are all the people in our community. We have diversity, but you all think the same way and follow exactly the same rules and logics and everything else. You don't actually have diversity. All you have is a, a diverse portfolio of um, identity capital. And that, so that's not genuine diversity. That's not genuine um, resilience. Uh, genuine diversity is, it, it goes down to what people actually are. It comes down to a lot of people having very different ideas and talking together and yet somehow still forming a community with very strong bonds and that is uh, productive. If you have that, if you have as many different kinds of people with different capabilities and abilities and thought processes and worldviews uh, who can yet cohere uh, together around that organizing principle of, you know, maintaining, you know, a, a collective that is individual and diverse at the same time. Um, if you have that, then you have resilience. Yeah. But I mean, that is very difficult in a movement because you expect everybody to be marching in lockstep together. You know, you're all supposed to be cohering around, you know, one idea, but that's why, like, I, as far as I'm concerned, the only really successful movement that's ever existed was um, Occupy, the Occupy movement, which everybody considers to be a failure and a disaster. But I think it's the most, that was the most resilient movement ever because <laughs> And everyone think it, thinks it passed away, but it, it didn't. Um, <laughs> that was very diverse people, all with different aims and objectives and goals, you know, um, still cohering together for, you know, a brilliant moment. And then everybody thinks it disappeared because the branding disappeared and the name disappeared. But, I mean, most of the people I talk to and, and am involved with were, were, have come out of the Occupy movement in one way or another. And in the time after it was called Occupy in the time since then um, have produced amazing things, huge solutions. It's been the most productive and dynamic and fertile ground that's ever happened in a movement. Uh, but what that movement did not do was seize power and then just become 
the institution that it was seeking to overthrow. That's why it's regarded as unsuccessful. See, <laughs> there's this trick that's happened to us, this illusion, this idea that in order to be a change maker, in order to be an activist, your goal, I mean, basically you have to change yourself. You have to get a group of people, a group of wild people, and you have to domesticate them all into one way of thinking and gain enough momentum and power together to overthrow um, the, the powerful that are, that are making the mess in the first place. But in order to do that, you have to become like them. And then you have to basically just take over those reins of power and then keep replicating the same destructive patterns. Um, that's when you're allowed to have a successful movement. So yeah, I mean, and pretty much everybody follows that blueprint. Even people who are aware of that, I've, I've just noticed they do it anyway. But I, and that's why I believe the Occupy movement was the only successful change-making thing uh, to happen in the history of civilization. Well, that makes me feel good personally because I definitely was, I'd say the Occupy movement has been in my activist lineage. I came out of that. It was really the the catalyst for me. And um, so, yeah, I think it had issues like anything Mm. humans try to do but i certainly felt moved by it yeah so it was nice to hear but you know one thing we were talking about earlier was violence but really briefly so i want to come back there uh and this past year at least in the united states we've really been reminded of the ways in which the media seems to capitalize and sensationalize civil violence, you know, leading the public to fervently consume snippets of violence through social media and the news. And I do think that in some ways, white supremacy conflates violence with entertainment. But this isn't to make the claim that violence is inherently evil or that this could be chalked up to uh, a misplaced obsession. So I'd like to ask you about this phenomenon in context to what you call contemporary monopolies of violence. What are some of the fundamental myths around violence you see rampant in global systems? And do you see the media as one monopoly on violence? Yeah. Well, I, I guess there's two kinds of violence. There's violence that creates transformation and lifts everybody up. So all participants, so, you know, <laughs> there's no just, you know, encoder and decoder of the violence and one of them dies. Um, yeah, so there's violence that lifts everybody up, lifts the entire community up and, um, you know, increases the sort of consciousness or the, you know, the creative capacity of that group. Uh, and that's sort of a ritualized violence, which unfortunately the niche of spectator sports that's a niche that spectator sports is occupying at the moment, unfortunately, which is actually just twisted around. See, there's a shadow of everything. It's just twisted around to that no good uh, shadow of violence, which is not about transformation. It's not about creation. It's not about um, increasing relatedness and making good relation as an outcome. Uh, it's, it's about destroying those things, you know? So there's, you know, Oh, you know, there's those forces of creation and destruction in the world. And there's supposed to be a tension and balance between these things. But, you know, the problem is that it's easier to break shit than make shit. And at the moment, there's more people breaking shit than there are people making shit. It's really hard to make shit. And it's really heartbreaking when someone just smashes it. And then while you're putting it together, they're smashing the other thing. And then you're almost done and then they come and smash that. That's very easy for them to do. Now, that kind of violence, that entropic violence, that lawless violence, that's what it is. It's, it's violence without law, without protocol, without anybody overseeing that as a ritualized behavior, you know, um, to maximize transformation and minimize damage. You know, if you don't have that, then your violence is just rubbish. And that's just what you see now. And I guess the, um, your laziest people who've sort of given into a more easy path of, you know, 
uh, gaining short-term sort of uh, gratification from breaking shit rather than the longer-term thriving of making shit. You know, these are the people who are attracted to those things. And we have that right now that's, I don't know if I can use the word metastasize in, twice in the same interview, but I'm going to because that's what's happened to you. And that's, that's really kicking off. Uh, that's going to be not good, you know, even in the short term. But, you know, particularly over the next decade as everything unravels, which everything is in this Anglosphere, um, you're staring down the barrel of a very big economic shift uh, globally. I don't think people have fully realized the implications of that yet, of what's uh, shifted already. <laughs> like uh, people are still sitting in an illusion of a, of a normal that was uh, in a lot of cases, and they haven't really seen the damage done yet. Uh, but, you know, we're staring down a very difficult decade. You know, just if it was just the economic side, that would be cataclysmic enough, but it's everything else, you know, culturally, politically, and the sort of shift in the habits of people, you know, uh, that's been happening since about 1971. Um, that's when all these things came into play. Uh, so I was born in 72. So I was born into a, into a new world that nobody realized was a new world yet. Um, you know, a, a particular uh, macro system that was very much designed for maximum extraction that's <laughs> been horrendous and, and we've all been kind of manipulated um, sort of neurolinguistically programmed, you know, into this thing. And I guess that's going to be playing out quite horrendic, uh, horrendously in the short term and in the mid term and probably in the long term. Um, but I'm, I feel quite excited about that though, because, um, you know, I believe that the sooner the thing collapses, the sooner we can get on, uh, starting starting up the thousand year cleanup and figuring out how we're going to look after each other while we do that. Yeah, I like that vision of cleaning up and taking care of each other. That's yeah, that's yeah, the real hope. Um, if that if I can use that word, which I have not used for years because I also see it as being problematic. Yeah, I, I have another question for you, and I know we are getting to the end of our conversation, but I'm, I'm just thinking about the Western or colonial global system gives us ways of classifying ourselves in a sort of hierarchy of colonized, colonizer, oppressed, oppressor. And I think these histories and stories and recognition are obviously valuable as we reckon with history. But I do wonder at which point do they sort of hit their limit? And I've heard you speak about how these identities really foster an environment where we all become very obsessed with trauma stories and we sort yeah. of demand them and then end up reproducing them. And I'd really like to ask you about that, but I also think about how our media is also really feeding us these trauma stories and it's becoming its own language and the mm. perils that it poses. Mm. So what does this pervasiveness of trauma porn do to all parties on a collective level? Yeah, well, it, it, it forces us to, um, you know, like we have to upgrade our, <laughs> Oh my God. We have to up, upgrade our like trauma credits, like personally, you know, because um, trauma narratives are capital as well, like personal capital, you know, identity capital, all the rest of it. Um, so we're all forced to dig around in the, and, and revisit and relive and um, inflate and conflate all these things, you know, out across our entire personal little universe. Um, you know, it, yeah. I don't know. So I often say that the trauma doesn't happen at the moment of impact and trauma happens later. Uh, trauma is your, uh, your failure to make meaning, um, uh, of, of a, of an event. Okay, that's all it is. And you have to make meaning around that in the real world, what that means in the real world, you know, under the sort of laws of the land and the laws of physics. Okay. What does that really mean? And, you know, in the patterns of, me as an organism that belongs to a species that follows these patterns, 
what does that mean in the picture of that? Uh, what do we learn from that? How do I transform and then transform the people around me from that? Boom, you're done. doesn't matter what happened, happened to you. There's no trauma then. But instead, we, we have to actually, you know, we're expected to wear these narratives on our sleeve. Um, you know, it, it's kind of, that's your pass to get into the room kind of thing. It's your capital to enter these spaces where you might be able to compete for some kind of value uh, and kick the can down a bit longer so that you can survive. So, I mean, I don't blame anybody for doing that. Uh, that just is what it is. Um, I don't know. It's, it's very difficult, <laughs> but basically you do have that, you know, I was talking about that shadow world, the net that's over everything. And all of these um, dichotomous identities, so colonized, colonizer, um, these are our shadow images in that net. Because when you get beyond that and you look down and in, you know, uh, to that real world, to that what you're calling the wild, you know, we are organisms, we're a species, and that is patterned uh, similarly everywhere with amazing individual unique expressions and then regional expressions, you know, as well, because we're, um, we're mirroring very diverse bioregions and ecosystems, you know, in our patternings, but there are, there are common patternings right across that allow us to flow and move and trade and hybridize across and between all of these systems and keep them vibrant and vital, you know, and that's what we do. You know, so beneath that, we, we are beneath that net of like these shadow identities. Um, we are something else, you know, much, uh, much more vibrant, um, beautiful, glorious things we are. Um, and you just glimpse that every now and then. And I think anybody who's glimpsed it um, is never the same again because you know what your potential is you know, as a species and you know what your ecological niche is and every cell in your body, every molecule is, you know, crying out for that, you know, to be that, to live that, to get out of the cage. You want to get there and then do that, be that. Um, but <laughs> yet we are, you know, as much in our shadow and in that net of the Anglosphere around the planet um, as we are in, in the other side, even when we're there. So, um, yeah, I guess we just, it probably sounds like I'm working towards a solution for you here and I'm going to give you this amazing tip and you'll be inspired and go, oh my God, that's amazing. I'm going to do that, but I'm not, I don't have the answer for that yet. Uh, that's just going to have to work its way out. It's weird because that shadow world is also part of creation. Um, it's just in a weird moment of imbalance and disequilibrium at the moment. Um, so I guess we'll see where it all ends up as the sort of mud settles to the bottom of the, of the pond. Thank you for listening to For the Wild podcast. The music you heard today was by 40 Million Feet, Marty O'Reilly and the Old Soul Orchestra, and Violet Bell. For the Wild is created by Ayana Young, Erica Ekram, and Francesca Glassbell. 